Hi, I'm Wouter from Triply and this is part 4 of my Sparkle tutorial. Today we look into introducing new bindings in the Sparkle query. In the previous episode we took a look at triple patterns and triple patterns allow you to match information coming from a knowledge graph and then return it as bindings to uh, the using application through Sparkle. Um, but what we did not yet do is introduce bindings that are not directly emanating from a knowledge graph. So bindings that you can introduce yourself. Let's start out with the query that we wrote last time and let's see how we can add those bindings to it. So this is the query that we wrote last time. This is the triple pattern. The triple pattern has a variable, a ground term in the middle and then a variable at the end. And when we run this query we get a column of Pokemon and a column of colors, colors of the corresponding Pokemon of course. That's nice, but now we want to add a variable that is not directly included in the triple pattern and we can do that in Sparkle using the bind keyword. The bind keyword has two internal components. The first one is the term that we want to bind. So let's say we want to bind the string literal uh, high, like that. It's just a simple string. Then we have the keyword S, which connects the ground term to the variable. And then on the right hand side we have the variable. We're not going to use color and we're also not going to use Pokemon. We're going to use a new variable called, uh, let's see, uh, greeting. Now in order to return this high binding, we must of course also add it to the projection because otherwise it's never exposed outside of the query. So let's go to the projection and let's add the greeting over there. Let's run the query. And as you can see, the table now contains three columns instead of two. It still has the Pokemon column, it still has the color column, and now it also has the greeting column. And it's just saying hi in each of these cells. So that shows you how you can introduce a simple string yourself. The string hi does not necessarily have to be present in the knowledge graph. You can just insert it yourself. Now we want to do something slightly more useful. I mean, this greeting hi is still quite simple. So let's go to this next query where I have already prepared a more interesting uh, ground value. This is a literal ground value which consists of the string point, opening brackets, and within the brackets I have two values and those are actually coordinates, uh, longitude, uh, latitude, longitude coordinates. Uh, but I also see something special over here. I actually see an entire IRI over there and this is not an IRI ground term, uh, which we saw previously. So previously we saw an IRI denoting the notion of color. So it was connecting Pokemons to their respective colors. This is an IRI that is part of the literal ground term. So it's actually a component of the literal. And this component is often called the data type IRI. It specifies the data type under which we should interpret the literal. So if you take a more in-depth look at this literal, so this whole thing over here is together composes the literal. This literal consists of two subcomponents. On the left hand side we have the string and then on the right hand side we have this data type IRI and the data type IRI specifies how we should interpret the string on the left hand side. So how should we interpret the string on the left hand side? Well, if we look at this uh, data type you can see that the data type is coming from OpenGIS.net, which is a consortium for specifying standards about geospatial data. And this, uh, uh, this data type IRI denotes a WKT, which stands for well-known text, WKT, literal. And those literals are used to specify uh, shapes, uh, polygons, points, in this case it's a simple point. And that means that the string on the left hand side should not be interpreted as a, as a normal string like the high greeting that we saw before. No, this should be interpreted as a well-known text literal specifying a geospatial point, a geospatial coordinate. Now I'm binding this to the variable called location and when I run this query you can see that I can actually put it on a map. This is the location of the Triple offices. Now, you see a map over here, but this map is not itself returned by Sparkle. 
only the coordinate is returned by Sparkle. So how does that work? Well, let's go into these buttons over here. So in the YasGUI Sparkle editor, we allow different ways of visualizing uh, uh, query results. And the table is the one that you're probably most familiar with from previous queries that we ran. And you can see in the query view, it actually looks like this. So in the query view, you actually have this literal and then you have this data type specifying how to interpret the string component of the literal. You can actually even go a little bit deeper into how the Sparkle endpoint really returns it to you because this table is also just a visualization that is put on top of it. If you click on response, you can see the raw format of how Sparkle endpoints return results. In this case, we chose the, the JSON uh, result. And there you can also see that here is the point and here is the data type. Uh, we are not going to take a too deep of a look into this format. We may be doing that in some future video, but for now it's enough to understand that if you see something visualized on the map, it's similar to seeing something visualized in a table. And underneath all of that, if you're a programmer, you may be more interesting in directly uh, retrieving results from the response format in JSON. Now I have a third and final example of using a of introducing a binding and this is a very interesting one. Let's take a look. It's also a bit more complex than the previous ones. So let me start with maybe uh, commenting out this second line. That's part of the pattern and remember commenting something out is done with the hash character. If you put in a hash character anywhere in a Sparkle, uh, Sparkle query, all of the characters after the hash are part of the comment until the end of the line. Okay, so this is basically very similar to queries we did in the past where we have a triple pattern. And this triple pattern consists of a Pokemon on the left hand side, then a property which is weight. In the past we used color, but weight is not a property that Pokemons happen to have. And then on the right hand side I have a variable called weight in kilograms because the weight in the knowledge graph is stored in kilograms. So if I run this, I see that I have uh, two columns, or three columns actually. So I have a column for Pokemon, a column for the weight in kilograms and a column for the weight in pounds. But the weight in pounds is currently not part of the pattern. It's over here, but it's commented out. So this is the same as if I would have this query, right? That's what a comment does. Okay, good. So now you also know what happens when you put a variable in the projection that does not appear in the pattern. It will be part of the table, but the cells of the table will be empty. Okay, that's interesting to know. But the thing that we want to focus on now is this column uh, containing the weight in kilograms. And there you can see that the weight in kilograms is expressed as a literal. And there you see, as in the previous example, that there is this IRI, which specifies how we should interpret the literal string value. So the literal string value is one, but it's not a normal string. No, it's something that should be interpreted as an integer, so as a whole number. Now let's uncomment this bind. So we have a triple pattern. The triple pattern returns Pokemons and literals that should be interpreted as integers. And now with this binding, we're going to introduce something new. We're going to introduce a binding for the variable weight in pounds, which is of course different from the weight in kilograms. And actually, how is it different? It's different in that we multiply the weight in kilograms with this number. This is actually the conversion number that I looked up on the internet. So this is the conversion, how you get from kilograms to pounds. But as we did before, we specify this ground term, this conversion rate as a literal, but then part of the literal should also indicate how we should interpret the string value. And that's done in this data type IRI. This data type IRI tells us that the string value over here, 2.20462, should be interpreted as a float. That is a floating point number. Now let's see, if we run this query, we again get a table with three columns. And now we also get values for the weight pounds column. The weight in pounds is a literal, and this literal should be interpreted in terms of float, uh, should be interpreted as containing floating point 
numbers. So in this case, it's exactly equal to the conversion rate because these are one kilograms. But here you can see three kilograms and then it's 6.6 .6, and for five kilograms it's 11 point something. And also looking at this thing over here, so the weight in kilograms is stored as an integer in the knowledge graph. But because it's multiplied, this is the multiplication sign, because it's multiplied by a floating point number, the result in weight pounds will also be a floating point number. And this is very similar to how it's done in programming languages. So in programming languages, if you multiply a whole number with a floating point number, you typically get a floating point number back. Now, we've introduced or we've shown you uh, three queries each of them introducing bindings and there are actually different types of bindings as you can see. So there are bindings, uh, let's see, there are bindings like this that are completely independent of the knowledge graph. This location is not stored in the Pokemon knowledge graph at all. It's just a location that I typed in in the Sparkle query and returned just like this. And there are bindings that do include a variable that is also part of a triple pattern. And this is of course an interesting combination because this allows you to retrieve one thing from the knowledge graph, in this case the weight in kilograms, and to return it in some other format to your users, to your applications. So maybe you have an application in which the weight should be shown in pounds because you have users who expect to see units in pounds. And then you can use a binding like this to do the data transformation. I hope you now also understand why those binding, bindings are very useful because they allow you to sort of tweak the results that come from a knowledge graph a little bit. And this is very often necessary in order to make the data that is stored literally in the knowledge graph uh, useful to your using applications. Uh, this was the fourth episode. In the next one we will look at, uh, uh, we will look at group patterns because in all the queries that we saw until now we've used at most one triple pattern. So we were always matching at most one triple from the knowledge graph, maybe adding some of our own bindings, but always one triple from the knowledge graph. And in the group patterns episode, we'll show you how to uh, match a more complex pattern to the knowledge graph. So let's do that next time.